The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus was led up by the the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up, took him to the holy city, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you, sisters and brothers, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the past week, we have shifted from the season of Epiphany into the season of Lent. And for some of this, this shift may seem abrupt because we didn't have the Ash Wednesday experience to help us bridge those seasons due to the cancellation of our Wednesday evening service. So it might be wise for us to think back to last Wednesday and its meaning meaning at the start of our 40 days of Lent. The overwhelming tone of that solemn day is humility, unworthiness, and repentance. Our need for a Savior is never more evident than on Ash Wednesday when we are reminded in words and in actions that we are created from the dust of the earth and it is to that dust that we shall return. Our first lesson for today continues in that vein. In fact, the reading from Genesis 2 and 3 tells of the fall of humankind from the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, Eden and the curses that have been placed on humans as a result of their disobedience to God by eating forbidden fruit from the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I've heard it both ways. One of the takeaways from this first lesson is that human beings were formed with great care to be in relationship with their God with the creation, and with one another. And even though Adam and Eve disobeyed their creator, God continued wanting to stay connected with them, ultimately finding a way by sending his son to atone for their sins to bring the world into right relationship again. In today's second lesson, that powerful statement In the book of Romans, Paul revisits the Genesis story 
to illuminate Jesus Christ and bring and how Jesus brings us from sin and death to grace and life. This New Testament book was written 50 some years after the birth of Christ and it was intended that uh, Paul could provide a comprehensive explanation of the good news that God saves all who believe in him. Believers are restored to right relationship with God because of their faith in Jesus Christ, not because they keep the Jewish laws perfectly. And then we reach Matthew's gospel, which comes immediately after Jesus' baptism, when God pronounces from the heavens that this is his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. I find it interesting that in Matthew, um, we are told that Jesus is led up into the wilderness by the spirit to be tested by the devil. The wilderness of course, is where the nation of Israel was also tested in Old Testament times. So we have a parallel here, which leads me to a few questions that I don't have ready answers to, but um, I'm going to ask for your input on, and maybe we can puzzle through them together. So here goes. Why do we read that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And doesn't it seem like God and the devil are kind of in cahoots together here in this scene? Are they working in tandem with the, the, the spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness and the devil tempting him? Is God using the devil to test Jesus and to prove his legitimacy as God's son? I wonder about that, and maybe you do too. It seems like the Spirit's leadership is what makes the devil's testing possible. Another question for us to ponder, what would this time of testing accomplish in God's grand scheme of things? And note that the time of the testing is 40 days and 40 nights. What's the significance of that, of that, four, that number 40? Well, certainly it reminds us of 40-day fasts by Old Testament characters Moses and Elijah. And there's a parallel there, too, to 40 years of testing of the Israelites in the wilderness. And yet another question. There seems to be an intentional use of the word testing in this passage rather than temptation. Is there a difference between those two words? Why does the gospel writer called Matthew choose to use the word testing more than he chooses to use temptation? These are some questions I think we can ponder and maybe talk with each other about um, later on. And the devil has a key role in this time of testing, too. What's up with that? It may be that, you know, that God uses the devil to make this time of testing come to pass. In Matthew, Satan attempts to deflect Jesus from the course of his messiahship, first by appealing to Jesus' hunger as a human being and uh, encouraging him to turn stones into bread to assuage his hunger. And here, Jesus replies by quoting the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, and saying that, one lives spiritually on the word of God, not by bread alone. What's interesting to me about this is that Jesus reflects a messiahship, reflects a type of a being a type of savior um, that is focused only on material 
good works, but he makes feeding hungry and destitute people an important part of his ministry. So he himself goes without food, yet he, he preaches to his disciples and to all of us the importance of providing food for those who are in need. Satan's second testing of Jesus is a challenge to Jesus' identity as the Messiah. Taking Jesus to the highest pinnacle of the Jerusalem temple, Satan quotes scripture by saying, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. In other words, they're not going to let you fall. But Jesus replies, again, it is written in the scriptures, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Finally, Satan offers Jesus the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, as though they were Satan's to give away in the first place. But he offers these to Jesus if Jesus will turn away from God and bow down to worship him, to worship Satan, that is. He says, all these I will give you if only you will bow down and worship me. And once again, Jesus responds by quoting scripture, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now, you have to hand it to Satan. He, he can quote scripture with the best of them, and he doesn't easily give up. Nonetheless, he strikes out a third time and eventually leaves the scene. Immediately, God's angels come to Jesus and minister to him in his weakened state. And unlike the children of Israel of the Old Testament, Jesus emerges from his ordeal in the wilderness victorious, proving that he is the true Israelite. Jesus' time of testing goes much better than it did for the Israelites, and he demonstrates his loyalty to God by resisting the devil and remaining faithful to his identity as God's only son. You know, as I, I think about testing, I, I'm aware that there are many occupations and professions today that require that people take tests um, to, or acquire a set of credentials or pass an exam in order to practice their occupation or, the, or career. I'm thinking about fields like nursing, which require that um, candidates take a board exam, um, thinking of pu certified public accountants who have to pass a rigorous set of exams. Plumbers, electricians um, may also have to pass um, uh, exams that will license them to practice their trade. Um, teachers, of course, have uh, licensure exams. Truck drivers, I believe, also do and on and on and on go the, uh, the list of tests that people may, may have to pass. And thank goodness we did not have to passage the, pass theological licensure exams to become pastors, although there are still plenty of hoops to jump through for that. Jesus passed some tests that we hope we are never asked to take like going without food for 40 days and nights and resisting the allure of power and glory. And those are just a couple of them. Jesus certainly could have given in to temptation, but he stayed true to what he had been called to do. In Christ, God chose to stand with us and by us in love, fully human and fully divine. And it's the divine part that was tested in our gospel lesson today. 
after 40 days in the wilderness, three temptations, three refusals to submit to temptation, and after a multitude of angels came to attend to him, Jesus gets on with the task at hand, teaching, healing, and loving people for the sake of God. And he asks us to take up that task as well. Jesus withstood temptation because his love for us was greater than his earthly desire. If our love for God reflects this strength, then we can withstand anything that threatens to stand between us and God's love. May that be our goal and our desire this Lenten season. In Jesus' faithful name, amen.